actually Tantra is, you know, it's really a confusing term because it has got lots of connotations, lots of meanings, and uh, that branch has got lots of branches also. That Tantra. So, uh, Kerala Tantra is slightly different from all the other branches of Tantra. So, it's, it's really a contribution of these, you know, Kerala Brahmins or Brahmudris. So, and the union, that's also the actually contribution of Kerala Brahmin. So, I think. Uh, he first he asked me to talk about aluminium. So uh, actually I don't know much about aluminium. I don't have the first hand experience because uh, aluminium is a Rigvedic competition. And uh, I'm a Yajurvedi basically. So it's like a two castes actually. And uh, if there are two castes, one caste doesn't need to know the ritual system of other castes. In the same way, the Rigvedi, the ritual system and everything of Rigvedi is different from the Yajurvedi. Uh, so, and uh, I learned all the Yajurvedic rituals and all those things and the way, uh, how Yajurveda is recited. And it's different from the Rigvedic style. And Aminim is a Rigvedic competition. So when he asked me to talk about that, I told him uh, that, you know, I don't, I haven't learned the Rigveda, but definitely I know lots of things general things about Anunium because uh, Anunium happens in my place or uh, it happens uh, at Kadavallu which is not far from my place so though I haven't got the training in you know Rigvedic recitation or something like that I know how it is conducted so I told him that I just give the general things now, I cannot go into detail and uh, there are lots of technical things in that so I cannot explain all those things but I will tell the general things. So these two things are connected actually, Tantra and uh, Anuinium. Uh, both actually are contributions of Kerala, or uh, both happen in Kerala. So and, uh, I've planned it just, you know, uh, presentation. Uh, and I try to connect all those things. And so if I have to connect, uh, I need to tell something about the unique nature of the Nampudris, I think. Otherwise, uh, or if you know uh, how Nampudri culture is different from other Brahmin cultures. Brahmins are there everywhere, but Kerala Brahmin's culture is very different uh, because the Western Ghat separates Kerala from other uh, states. So that separation caused this distinction, I think, anyway. So, and... Uh, uh, this uh, Rigvedic, uh, it is said, I don't know much in detail, but lots of scholars have said that the Vedic tradition is act, uh, unique in, at least in Kerala. I don't know the Vedic tradition of other states, but lots of scholars have told that, Vedic scholars. And the same recitation that was used at the Vedic times is used now in Kerala. And uh, I will just explain explain some of the, you know, differences between the other states later, uh, when we deal with that anemia. And uh, so, so that separation is there. So in every aspect, the tremble worship also, and this tantric worship is entirely different from other argument worships that you find other states. So, and I will also come to that later. So first, we need to just, uh, uh, know something about the origin of Nambudris or something like that. The only thing we can say about the origin is that we don't know... Uh, the only thing we can say about Nambudri is that they came from some other places. And uh, we don't know when they came to Kerala and we don't know uh, where, uh, from where they uh, came to Kerala, but one thing is certain, they came from some other places. And... Um, According to one legend, we don't have the clear proof. So uh, even when the scholars, the historians, describe about the origin of Nambudris, uh, they just describe those legends because they don't have any other proof. And so the most famous legend is that Parashurama created Kerala. Uh, that's the most famous legend. And uh, he killed, uh, uh, as per that legend, you know, he killed all the... Uh, Kshatriyas, uh, uh, then uh, as a part of his repentance, he created a land 
and from Gagarnam, I think which is it's now Goa, I don't know. And from Gagarnam, he threw his axe, and the sea, the ocean moved away, and a land came up, and he gave that land to Brahmins, and that land is now Kerala. That's the popular legend. And another legend is that hmm, when Chera Perumal uh, gave the land to uh, Brahmins, so all the legends agree one thing that you know this land is given to the Brahmins from somebody, and the Brahmins came from some other places. So and we don't have clear proofs before uh, seven or uh, eight seventh or eighth century, and. Uh, some, some historians say that this migration happened <coughs> at a particular time in, in history, maybe uh, at the period of Sanghagala or something like that. And, but some other historians say that uh, this migration happened successive in travels. It never happened at, at a particular time in history. And in my, maybe first or second century, some Brahmins from some other places uh, might have come. And around the seventh or eighth century, some other group might have come. And uh, anyway, they came from some other places. And uh, uh, when they came, and uh, within a couple of centuries, they became very powerful. Of course, almost all the other places, Brahmins were powerful, but in Kerala, they were the most powerful community. And, uh, and that also we don't know how they became this much powerful, we don't know. And uh, some historians are in the opinion that uh, they supported, they, they brought the Chera king from some other places. So they were the king makers. So since, because they were the king, king makers, they got that much power, they got that much influence so, uh, um, in the Chera kingdom, and which was very popular in Kerala at that time. So anyway, they, they formulated some rules and regulations and they controlled almost all the other communities. Uh, they, uh, you might have heard about uh, Aitam, uh, that means, you know, untouchability. And it, the untouchability was everywhere in India. But in Kerala, this Nambudiri community was successful in just prescribing fixed rules for each and every community. One community sh shouldn't come this much uh, near to the Brahmin. And they prescribe rules for each and every community. So, and uh, they were that much su successful. And also, and uh, one more thing, they created another thing, uh, Sambandha. That means... Uh, <coughs> Alliance. Uh, yeah, it's a unique thing. I think you can find only in Kerala. Okay. In uh, at that time, you know, the joint family system was there. So, in order to avoid the conflict in that joint family system, what this number did was that you know, uh, only the eldest member was allowed to marry from the com same community, Nambudri community. All the other uh, brothers. Uh, younger brothers are uh, used to have, uh, you know, alliance with some other girls from other community. It, it was not permanent, it was only just temporary. So, uh, the, all the assets, you know, came under this uh, elder brother. So, there was no division of the property. So, by the most interesting thing is that how they achieved to convince the other communities to have this kind of temporary arrangement. That was the most wonderful thing. And the other communities also, and uh, uh, which, was, which were just below this, you know, Nambodari, the Ambalavi, in Kerala we call Ambalavasi. Uh, they are Savarmas, uh, but only second to this Nambodari community. And uh, all these communities, took this kind of temporary alliance as a privilege because they got a Nambudri to marry their girl even though it was just a temporary relationship uh, they got a uh, Brahmin so that kind of you know awareness or that kind of uh, uh, mood was created in the society so they could keep that uh, you know power for almost maybe for five or six uh, centuries 
Uh, and it was only just after the British people came that Gangotri started to lose this power. Uh, and after this independence, they completely lost the power. Anyway, so they had the power to control the entire society and they had the power to form any rules and regulations. So in controlling the society, what I'm trying to say is that not only just you know, creating this kind of highly intellectual doctrines and things, but also in just you know, uh, controlling the society, they were highly creative and they were highly imaginative. And now let's come to that you know, contribution. So uh, when they, the, the, the psyche of Kerala people is that, you know, uh, it's very elastic. Uh, or flexible, you can say. Uh, be, might be because of geographical reasons caused it that kind of elasticity. Because Kerala is a place, it's not like the other places in India where, as he told before, uh, you can see harsh climates. In the winter, it is pretty cold, and in the summer, it's pretty hot in uh, other places. But in Kerala, the temperature is moderate throughout the 12 months. And that moderation might be the reason, I think, maybe, because the people were uh, very flexible to accept new ideologies. That's why, you know, almost all the ideologies that you find around the world came to reach Kerala. And uh, first, uh, Buddhism uh, came to Kerala. And Buddhism, historians say that Buddhism was very popular in Kerala, maybe first century or second century. Uh, Jainism also was very popular. Then Christianity, even after, you know, maybe in the first century itself, after Christ's death, uh, St. Thomas was supposed to, uh, was believed to uh, reach Kerala and he converted some Brahmins. That, that's what legend says. Uh, but definitely one thing is sure, St. Thomas reached Kerala. And uh, so the first century itself, Christianity uh, reached to Kerala and Islam also reached Kerala. Finally, communism also got a strong hold in Kerala. So, and the, the psyche of, you know, the, or the social mind, Kerala, Kerala social mind is very elastic and it was ready to accept this kind of new ideologies. So, when Nambudiris reached there, it was the uh, nature of the society, elastic, and there was no uh, rules and that fixed rules and regulations. Each and different communities had different rules and regulations. So their task was actually to just get a kind of uniform structure. And if they have to do that, they have to be very strict, very rigid. So, and in one aspect, they try to be very strict and very rigid, and especially in the way. Vedic tradition. They knew that, you know, if they had to keep that intact, if they had to keep everything under their control, they had to be very strict in their, their, at least in the Vedic tradition. So they tried to be very strict in the Vedic tradition. That's why, you know, and they never diluted that Vedic tradition. And that's why you find maybe the, the same system that was present at the Vedic times, uh, you can still find in Kerala. Um, but in other fields, they were very flexible, especially in Ayurveda. And they never tried to keep the same Ayurveda thing that you find in other places. The, their contribution uh, was tremendous, actually. And uh, in temple worship, that's Sandra, and they, they, really, they were really highly imaginative. And they, what you call, invented lots of new methods uh, for the temple worship. And in astrology also, uh, their contribution was tremendous. So they changed a lot from other things. But in the Vedic tradition, they never tried to do any kind of dilution. But in other places, uh, when the Bhakti movement came, this Bhakti movement and this Vedic tradition got mixed up. That's why, you know, uh, 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 I will just give you some examples. Um, in Nitya Karma, I don't know whether you know that Nitya Karma, every Brahmin is supposed to do uh, some, some rituals in the morning and evening. Um, Sandhya. Uh, Sandhya, yeah. 
So that's Santiago Ganem actually. Um, almost in every place of India, that Santiago Ganem is there, and that's a part of Vedic tradition. Okay, Santiago Ganem is actually is Shrava right? or Vedic uh, tradition, and but in other places, I don't know. In, in more, almost all the states, that's the case. But at least in the southern states, that's the case. I know. Uh, before that, Sandhyavandana, there is a Sangalpa. <coughs> First they do the Sangalpa, uh, then after that they do the Sandhyavandana. Uh, in that Sangalpa they say, uh, Parameshara Pritiyartham or Narayana Pritiyartham. Um, that's the way they do the Sangalpa. So this Parameshara and Narayana, these concepts came in the, at the Bhakti period. So, and when this Bhakti movement came, they took that. Sangalpa and I'm doing this uh, Sandhya Vanam for Narayana Pritiyartha or Parameshwara Pritiyartha. They mix it up, these things. But in Kerala, we never, or at least in Nambudris, never do this Sangalpa before Sandhya Vanam. Sandhya Vanam is purely Vedic. And uh, there is no Narayana Pritiyartha or there is no Parameshwara Pritiyartha there. And uh, second thing, in Vedic times, the bell. Uh, was never used for rituals. Bell came later, after the Bhakti movement. And, but at least in the southern states, I don't know about the northern states, southern states, they use this uh, bell even in the Shraddha uh, uh, Karmas or this kind of, you know, uh, Vedic rituals. Uh, but in Kerala, only in the temple worship, this bell is used. But in Vedic rituals, this bell is not used even now. Right? So sec that's the second thing. And third thing, uh, you can find lots of uh, traces of uh, temple worship in other places, at least in southern states, uh, in, uh, when they uh, do the uh, Vaidika Karmas. And, uh, especially the, in the use of flowers, in the use of incense, incense sticks, uh, those sort of things. But in Kerala, we, uh, Nambudris try to keep this temple worship and the Vaidika Karmas as two separate things. They, uh, they never got mixed up. So, and uh, same thing in the Vedic recitation also. In other places, because of the influence of the local language, some of the songs got changed. Uh, but in Kerala, still that same song which was used, you know, uh, at the Vedic times is used now. And uh, I'll just give you one example. Uh, when, when we uh, recite the Sahasranam, in almost all the other places, Sahasra Chirisha Purusha Sahasra Sahasra Pa. Ta is the spinal sound actually. But in Kerala, the chill, I don't know what's uh, English, what's chill, L. Uh, L. Uh, L. That's a chill, chill song. Uh, what is the English for that? I don't know. Yeah, anyway, that L is used, not a th. Uh, so that L was used at the Vedic time, Sahasrapal, not Sahasrapal. Uh, but because of that, you know, might be uh, because of the regional influence, the influence of the regional languages, it was changed into Sahasrapal. And another thing, um, Visargam, use of Visargam. Um, Nama, after that, there are two daughters. Uh, you know, and in almost all the other places, it's pronounced as Namaha. But in Kerala, it's used, pronounced as Nama, not Namaha. Uh, according to uh, Sanskrit grammar, four sounds are uh, uh, A, Ka, Ha, and Visarga. These are Kantavya sounds. A, Ka, Ha, uh, and Visarga. So, Ha and Visarga, they are two separate sounds actually. But in other places, since both of these sounds are Kantavya, uh, this, uh, since this Nama is a bit difficult to pronounce, uh, they uh, started to use Nama, Ha instead of Nama. But in Kerala, the same thing is used, Nama. Almost, and it's a bit difficult to say Nama all the time. If you have to chant the Sastra Nama, and if you have to say a thousand times Nama, 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 it's going to be difficult. So, and that 
things you see in Kerala. So these are the differences, you know, that's why, you know, um, the, the Vedic tradition is kept intact. Uh, uh, it was never diluted, but in other places it was diluted uh, because of some other influences, uh, but in Kerala it was not diluted. And this anionium is a, one of the most important reasons why it never got mixed up. I will just come to that later. And, um, now, uh, yeah, uh, let's come to the Vedic learning actually. That also caused, uh, that was also one of the reasons why this Vedic tradition was kept intact actually. And uh, in the, uh, of course, everywhere, Vedic, in the Vedic tradition, meaning is not uh, important actually. Uh, never in India, in, uh, in no schools actually, the meaning of uh, Veda was taught. Meaning was not at all important. Uh, uh, if you try to just get the meaning of Veda, you get only a contradictory meaning. Some, in some Rik you may find they say one thing and the very next Rik, and if you try to get the meaning, you may see really a contradictory thing actually. So uh, that's why Fritz Stahl, one of the Vedic scholars, I think he was in, from California University, I, think, I don't know from where he was. Um, he conducted a lot of researches. Uh, uh, he came to Kerala four or five times and he attended uh, three or four yetnyas in Kerala and he published two or three books also. So he commented uh, in, in his book on yetnya, uh, in the introduction he said, uh, don't look for meaning in the Veda, uh, because Vedic sounds resemble the sound of birds actually. And he found great resemblance between the sound of birds and the uh, Vedic chanting. Ah, when just you use the uh, swaras, it resembles actually the bird, sound of birds. And in Yetna also, the chidi is built uh, in the shape of a bird. So there is. He found great resemblance between the communication of the birds and this Vedic chanting. But we don't know. Uh, anyway, one thing is sure, the form is more important in the Vedas, not the content. So that's why, you know, in the Vedic tradition, the way it is chanted is always given more importance than the meaning. So that way is kept, in order to keep that always, you know, undiluted, uh, they were, they took great care just, you know, uh, to teach the students. Uh, so, actually in the Vedic tradition you find three things, Adhyana, Prayogam and Vinayogam. Adhyana means the learning. Yeah, yeah, and the learning is very important in the Vedic tradition. And without a master or without learning this all those things under a good master for a long period of time, maybe a couple of years, you cannot be uh, a master. So, learning is very important at Dhyanam. And another thing, Prayogam is also important. Prayogam is the application. You have learned this, all the recitation methods, but if you don't get the chance to use it, and if you don't use it regularly, you lose it. So, instead of that, they just formulated some methods of application. This anionium is one of the methods of application. Okay, I'll come to that later. So, and uh, the next one, Vinayoga. Vinayoga means, you know, there are lots of uh, riks in Veda. Lots of riks in Veda. And uh, some riks are used in some particular context. So, which rik is used at which context? That, that science is actually, or that, that system is called a Vinayoga. So, it is through these, through these three things, Adhyayan, Prayogam and Vinayogam, and they try to keep this intact and diluted actually. In Kerala, almost other places, you know, might be because, you know, uh, there was not that much profit. Uh, if, to do all these things, you need a long time, you know, uh, maybe a couple of years. And after that, there was not that much, you know, benefit, material benefit. They had to survive anyway. So that might be the reason uh, they started to do some other temple worship and finally they got, these two things got mixed up. 
And, but in Kerala, it never happened. These two things, because of this aluminium, all this kind of, they got the chance to apply all those things. They got the platform to use all those things. They never had the uh, scarcity of platform for applying all those things. That's why, you know, that might be the reason. It's still, you can find in Kerala all those things. And another thing, in Kerala, you, you can find almost all the branches of the Veda. Uh, in Rigveda, there are two branches, Ashrayana and Kaushintaka. There are two branches, actually. And in other states, you can find only one branch. And uh, uh, even if the two branches are there, you cannot find more families which belong to this. Maybe one Kaushitaka family is there in one state, but that's not enough to conduct a yetna. So, uh, you know, if you want have to conduct a yetna, you need lots of people. So, one family is not enough. And, uh, so you find lots of Kaushilaga and lots of uh, Ashvayana families in Kerala. So there is no scarcity of uh, Rigvedic people. If you want Kaushilagi or Ashvayana, you, you, you will get that. And Yajurveda also, there are some divisions. Uh, the first division is Krishna Yajurvedam and Shukla Yajurvedam. And uh, in Krishna Yajurvedam, there are three sections, Baudhayana, Babulaga, and Avastamba. In Kerala, most of the Yajurvedis are actually Baudhayana, but still there are some Babulaga and Avastamba. So that Yajurvedi, almost all the sections are there. And Samaveda, only in Samaveda, there are three divisions actually, but only Janinium is present in Kerala. And that too, maybe a couple of families. Especially in Panya, there are seven or eight families. And in some of the, you can find maximum only 10 or 15 families, Samavedis. So, except though that Samaveda, almost all the branches of Ved Vedic people are present in Kerala. That's why, you know, in Kerala, if you have to conduct a Yetna, you can do within a couple, maybe within a couple of months actually. Uh, but in other places, it's very difficult because they don't get people. Because in Yetna, all this, there's a need for all these people. But Yetna actually, you know, Rigvedis have some roles to play. In, in a particular yetna, take some uh, Somayaga. Rigvedis have some roles to play, Yajurvedis have some role to play, and Samavedis also have some roles to play. Since, you know, in other states they don't get all these people, they cannot conduct a yetna that much easily. But in Kerala they can do easily because all these people are there. So that's also one reason uh, still this Vedic tradition is intact in Kerala because. Uh, Nowadays, I think almost every year one Yetna is conducted in Kerala. Almost every year, I would say. Now it's a business also. So, and before that also, you know, people used to conduct Yetnas quite frequently. So these Vedic people got the chance to apply their knowledge regularly. Uh, that's why that system was uh, kept intact, actually. And um, now, uh, I'll just give you a brief idea about the uh, learning also, you know. In order to get the sound properly, what the teacher does is that there are three sounds in Veda. Uh, um, uh, uh, just, to, you know, Udhatam, Anudhatam, Swaritam. Udhatam means when the sound goes up. Anudhatam, when the sound comes down. And uh, so rhythm means when the sound bangs. You don't find all the sounds of uh, music in that. Saptasaram is not in uh, ve uh, uh, Vedas, but only these three sounds. Udhatams, the sound goes up, the sound comes down, and the sound bangs. These are the three sounds used in all the Vedas. So to teach the student, what the teacher does is that, uh, uses the head, using the head, when Udata is taught, uh, the teacher always puts the head of the student straight, putting the uh, hand like that, okay? And when he has to teach the Anudatam, he puts the head down. And again, when he has, next time maybe the Udatam, again, he brings it up. And when he has to teach the bending sound, he pulls the head to the right side. So by using the head, ah, 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 like that, the teacher teaches all those things.
And this is the way it started uh, in Kerala. I don't know how it is started in other states actually. And uh, so, and method also started, you know, first the teacher teaches the uh, text or samhita. It's called samhita. Samhita means text. Aknini lai purohidam, yaknasya devam rukhijam, whatever the uh, uh, Veda is or whatever the mantra is. Uh, first the teacher teaches the whole line. Then he divides that line into different padas. Akni, Ile, Purohitam, Yetnyasya, like that. Then he just teaches how to combine this thing, Sandhi. The Akni plus Ile, Akni like, like that. So, and it is through these different sections this way that is taught. So it takes maybe a couple of years. And if a student has to learn all those Vedas, I think uh, it will take around five or six years. So, uh, and also there are mudras also. And for each sound, each sandhi, they use the mudras. And that mudras are different from this, you know, the mudras that's used in uh, other art forms. It's different, but definitely they use some mudras. And in an union, these mudras are very important because in the competition, uh, the, uh, I, I will just uh, describe that later. In the competition, one team, there are two teams actually, when one team shows a mudra, only he shows the mudra, then another team start, has to start from that line. So, that kind of, you know. So, and uh, uh, this is the way it is taught actually. And after once, now let's come to the Rigveda. Uh, all up to this point, I know all those things, and uh, I've learned that. Now, next thing, you know, when I talk, when I'm going to talk about this Rigveda, uh, it's only general thing. I haven't got the first hand has the experience because basically I'm not a Rigveda. So, and in Rigveda, there are two schools in Kerala: Trishul School, Trishul Brahma Swamodam. There is a school to teach Rigveda, and the Tirunavaya School. Okay. It's around uh, maybe 40 kilometers. Uh, yeah, maybe 40 or 50 kilometers from Kichu. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are the two schools actually. And uh, now it's both of them are in Kerala, but before that, you know, before independence, one school was under Kochi, Kochi uh, kings, and the uh, next one was under Samuri. So it was a kind of tight or, you know, very bitter competition between these two before. Now it's just a, a kind of ritual. Uh, before it was a, you know, really, I have heard that, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, one person uh, who was participating in this uh, competition uh, might be the brother-in-law of the other person. So when they met or when they used to meet at the Anunyam, they never used to talk to each other. So that foreign spirit was that much high, you know. So, and this Anunyam, so these two schools teach the Vedas, the Swaras and everything, they are the same, but the methodology is slightly different. So, and every November, uh, this anunium is held actually. And in 1947, after independence, when this uh, temple proclamation, you know, treaty, uh, then all the people, before that only Nambudris was, uh, Nambudris were allowed to enter the temple. So when all the other people were allowed to enter the temple, they stopped this anunium. And uh, so this anunium was not there maybe for a couple of decades. It was stated just started again recently, maybe '79 or something like that. And um, so, uh, this is actually a union and the competition between two schools. There are two schools uh, which uh, teach Rigveda, and in order to test the knowledge, they used to conduct this kind of competition. That's actually what's called a union. And uh, in a union, uh, a union is actually a prayoga, an application. In Vedic text itself, there are some some prayogam methods mentioned actually. 
They are Padam, Kramam, Jada, Mala, Shikha, Rekha, Dvaja, Danda. These are the things mentioned in uh, Rigvedic text. But only three are uh, now in this Anunya, are actually only uh, Kramam, Jada and Ratha. These three prayogams are there in our Anunya. Now just I give you a brief idea about this. Um, uh, Rigveda has got two versions actually. According to one version, 10 mandalams are there, 85 anuvatams are there, 1017 suktams are there, 10,472 10, rits are there. And that's not, that version is not the version which is taken by the Nambudaris actually, or which is accepted by the Nambudaris. And according, Nambudaris accepts the other version, which has got 8 Ashtagams, 64 uh, Adhyayams, and uh, 2006 Valgams, 10,472 uh, 10, Rits. And this is the version accepted by the Nambudaris, and this is the version followed uh, by the Nambudaris. So, and this, there are 8 Ashtagams actually. So, Anunyam is held, or uh, uh, it, it has eight days actually. One Ashtagam is uh, uh, applied or practiced one day. Second Ashtagam is for the second day, third Ashtagam for the third day. So, it takes eight days to complete that. So, this is the format Anunyam. And uh, hmm. there are three competitions, Varam. But it's, which is Kramam and Jada and Ratha. In the Varam, starts after Divaratna around 6.30 in the afternoon. So almost all the Vedic scholars, or uh, Rigvedic scholars come there and they stay in the temple for eight days. So, and uh, these two schools, people from these two schools, they never talk to each other and because it's a really a competition. Uh, that competitive spirit is there. So after Divaratna, this competition starts uh, in the afternoon. Um, uh, first, uh, it's a varam. So uh, before that, you know, before the Dibharadana, they select which team has to do this, this varam. And it, in Malayalam, it's called Karamnirikal. I don't know. I, I, I don't think that they can translate that into English. That that process is called Karamnirikal. That means. Sitting, uh, friends, something like that. You can translate like that. Anyway, so and so that team which has to do this process, just uh, it's decided before this dibaratna, and after the dibaratna they start that. And so what they have to do is, uh, they have to the other team, they will select the uh, mantra that this uh, other team has to uh, do the prayoga. Uh, so it's really, really competitive. They never tell that. So what they do is, yeah, you have to chant this one. And the, 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 the contestant will be given 10 minutes to think about that. Yeah. And uh, after the 10 minutes, when he just, you know, he's comfortable that he can do that, he starts that. That's the thing. And what he has to do is, he has to tell or chant the, that mantra uh, using one, two, uh, or A, B, B, C, C, D, D, E, like that. For example, if it's Akni Mele Purohidam, if, that, if that's a line, Akni Ile, Ile Purohidam, Purohidam Yetnasya, Yetnasya Devam, Devam Rukhidam, like that. It's very difficult. If you have to learn Akni Mele Purohidam, it's very difficult to break it and Akni Ile. Again, you have to start from Ile. Ile. <laughs> so, and just like that, we have to chant that. Okay? And not only chanting, you have to show the mudras also. And another thing is that, normally when they learn the mudra, they use the right hand. Okay? But in this competition, they have to use the left hand. <laughs> and if even if once he uses the right hand, yeah, the, he fails. So it's very difficult because, you know, sometimes if you have learned showing mudras this way, definitely it will come up. 
So even without knowing, this will come up. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, he's out. So it's very difficult. That's a first competition, first step. And next is actually uh, Jada. Jada is a bit more difficult. He has to say A, B, B, A. Uh, there are two persons for Jada actually. So one person, the same way the other team decides a mantra. Uh, this contestant uh, doesn't have the right to decide, yeah, I will chant this. No, the other team will decide it. Nowadays, what happens is that, you know, almost all the people know each other. So, I know where you are comfortable and where you are not comfortable. If I know that it's all easy for me to decide, yeah, I know that he's not comfortable that far, so I will turn, yeah, you chant this far. These kind of things happen nowadays, okay. Before that also, this kind of competition was there. So, and uh, the opposing team will decide which mantra this other team has to chant. So, and there are two people, two persons sitting, uh, or two contestants. The first content stand will start like that. A, B, B, A, A, B. That means, Agni, Ile, Ile, Agni, Agni, Ile. How do you feel it is? Akni ele, ele, akni, akni ele. And when the first person stop that, the second person has to start from that last song, ele. And when the first person st says last ele, the second person has to start ele, purohidam, yetnasya. Like that. Okay? So it's very difficult. Uh, uh, again, when the second person completes that, again the first person, person starts from that section. So this is the way it's, and it's very difficult. And that's the second one. And last one is Ratha. And Ratha is going to be uh, more difficult actually. Uh, it's actually A, B, B, A, A, B, B, C, C, B, A. that. <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah, actually, first when first person says Agni Mile, second person has to say Ile Agni. Then first person again Agni Mile, second person Ile Purohidu. Like that, okay? So this is the way that uh, Ratha is going to be. And uh, when one completes all these three things, he is he, or he, is a, he becomes eligible for that. Next to title, Kavan Mirika. Uh, it's going to be very difficult. And now only in Kerala, there are only three persons who have done that. Uh, and, uh, and after that, there is another thing, Valiya Kavan Mirika, the big Kavan Mirika, whatever. Okay? And nobody in Kerala no, uh, who has done that. Okay? So, Another thing is that to be the judge of this competition, that person uh, should have done or should have just, you know, succeeded in doing that. So if somebody has to be the judge of that Valiya Kadamirika, there is nobody there because nobody has done that. So that's actually, you can say that it's vanished. Nobody can do that in future because no, there is nobody. So this is actually... Uh, of course, I haven't seen a union, and I haven't learned with Veda, but uh, since it, as I told you before, it happens in my place, so from, uh, I have lots of other friends who have uh, participated in that, so from them I got collected this information. Okay? This is actually a union, and because of this kind of a union, or this kind of competitive spirit, Nambudiris, who he that culture undiluted. Okay. So, because they used to get, or at least even now, they get the platform to apply all those things uh, with a competitive spirit. So, there is no chance for diluting. If you dilute something, you'll be failed actually. So, that's why, you know, it was, uh, it is still kept uh, undiluted. So, now I think. Uh, and other spheres, since they didn't have the chance to use their creativity, in this Vedic tradition they use the creativity in other fields, I think. 
in Ayurveda, uh, the, uh, the contribution of Mambudris is very high actually. In all the other places, there are three schools actually in Ayurveda, Charaga, Sushruta and uh, uh, Vagbhara. In North India, I think Charaga and Sushruta, they are the, these schools are most commonly followed, but in Kerala, this Vagbhara school is followed. Uh, Ashtanga Hrvim. And um, not only they follow that method, they, they just contributed much actually. And uh, Sahasra Yogam, the, you find lots of medicine. Uh, maybe if you go to in Kerala Ayurveda store, I think you can find more than uh, 5,000, uh, around 2,000, 3,000 combinations actually. And uh, I don't think that this much combinations are available uh, in North India. Okay. So, and, uh, and uh, in Ayurveda also, there is another brand actually, uh, Vishachi Gilsa, uh, toxicology or something like that. Um, snake bites, for, especially for snake bites. Not only really for snake bites, all kinds of toxicology. And uh, it's a very advanced in Kerala. In other place, I think it's that much advanced. Even now, there are very good Vishavaidyas in Kerala. And uh, I will just tell one incident. Uh, there is a family, I don't know you know that, uh, Enamavar, uh, Ullaimu. Okay. I know where Enamavar is. Yeah, and there is a family in Ullaimu. There is a lady, and she's practicing this Vishavaidyasa. And the two Years before, there was a report in Madhubhumi, a newspaper, that you know, one person was bitten by a snake, uh, a viper or something like that, and uh, she was taken to, that person was taken to uh, the best hospital, in Trichu, mission hospital, and uh, that person was there maybe a couple of hours, then there was no positive result, and after finally the um, doctors declared that he said you can take home. So and the relatives they took that you know dead body and uh, they were just traveling with the dead body in an ambulance. So one person just suddenly got a kind of small eye movement and first thing he thought it might be his feeling actually. Anyway, and he told to the other relatives. Then the other relatives suggested, and they were nearing this uh, this house actually, this Ullanur Mana. So the relatives uh, told, why couldn't we just take him to that Mana? Anyway, we can make sure. And they took that dead body to that Mana, and that this lady, uh, this uh, Vishwavidya, came there, and uh, she just simply watched. Then she told, if you had come a little bit earlier, I could have saved you. And anyway, let's try. And he, she just went inside and she took some herbs or something like that. And she made a juice and she applied it in her, uh, in the patient's eyes and also uh, lips also. Maybe after a couple of uh, hours, uh, his eyes started to move and his also started to just, you know, move his lips also. But anyway, that patient died. Then. But the thing is that, you know, the uh, Vishwaita told very clearly, if you had brought that patient a couple of hours before, I would have said it. So that much advanced. Vishwaita is very advanced in Kerala. And uh, also, uh, this is from my experience, actually. In my place, uh, uh, one, uh, one person was bitten by a snake. The same, there is another Vaidya, and that Vaidya is not that much popular, but uh, then, you know, lots of cases, actually. Uh, when the patient was sent back uh, from the hospital, uh, this special Vaidya cured. Okay. So, and uh, there are different families in Kerala, uh, hereditary families, and they have their own manuscripts. And the most tragic thing is that, you know, Nowadays, because might be because of this business competition, they never publish that. If they publish those those things, definitely it will be a great asset to humanity. But uh, they they never publish that. They